I'm Hog, this is The Dice. Hogwash is where I like to prattle endlessly about pop culture, and this week we're going to be jumping back to Middle-earth in order to talk about... No, you know what? No, this doesn't feel right. It, this, 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 this isn't right. Bear with me for a minute. I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and we're going to be talking about how the Middle-earth fandom makes Tolkien's work look more racist than it actually is. I'm not talking about Stuez intentionally taking things out of context in order to make them seem more racist. I'm talking about racists and white supremacists intentionally taking things out of context in order to make them seem more racist. But of course, racists and white supremacists aren't the only problem. Part 1. Actually Decent People Most of this is subtle and small. It's the little assumptions that we, and I include myself in this, as white people make based on the tiny little biases we've developed through our consumption of media that most of us don't even realize are there and don't notice. Most people automatically expect protagonists and even side characters to be white. This isn't our fault. After years and years of being exposed to media where white seems to be the default setting, our minds have been trained to have this expectation that characters are white. That can be so powerful that sometimes if we're reading a book that doesn't provide us with visual representations of the characters, like pictures and illustrations, that training can override the descriptions given to us in the book. Just look at the backlash there was a few years ago when Amanda Steinberg was cast as Rue in The Hunger Games, even though Rue was explicitly written as a black girl. This also manifested when Peter Jackson refused to even consider casting anybody who wasn't pale-skinned as a hobbit extra, despite the fact that in Chapter 1 of The Fellowship of the Ring, Tolkien describes the three hobbit ethnicities, says that one is brown-skinned, and that the brown-skinned Harfoots are in fact the most common kind of hobbit. That little nugget surprised you, didn't it? That most hobbits are brown-skinned? It surprised me too, but it's definitely what Tolkien wrote. In the first chapter of his most well-known book. And yet our collective consciousness, our fan interpretation, has rendered them all white-skinned. The Shire was literally whitewashed by fandom. Now, this stuff is still racist, and in some ways it's more insidious than outright white supremacism. But in other ways, it's more innocent as well. The white supremacist has consciously committed to a morally fucked viewpoint. The rest of us are just being affected by the background radiation of the world we live in. We still have a moral responsibility to watch out for it and try to cut it out of our thought process, but it doesn't make us bad people. But talking of bad people, let's move on to the next part. Part 2. White Supremacists For years, Tolkien scholars have waged a fight on two fronts against an academic establishment that for the most part refused to take the author's work seriously, and against white supremacists who have tried to claim the professor as one of their own. So despite the subconscious whitewashing of an entire species, most of us are pretty okay with the idea of race in Middle Earth. We've no problem with the idea that the region that's mostly desert and has elephants is probably mostly populated by people who aren't white. We've no problem with the idea that the region that's ge roughly geographically equivalent to Asia is probably mostly populated by people who aren't white. And most of us would be shocked to discover that there are many people who find those ideas horribly offensive. Back in February, a trailer for the game Middle Earth Shadow of War was released. I actually think the trailer looked pretty cool, but a lot of people had problems with it. Some were complaining about the idea of the forging of a new ring of power being contradictory to Tolkien's canon. Even though the books heavily hinted that Saruman had forged a new ring of power! But a lot more people were complaining about this. But I'm sure they all had reasonable comments to make. Let's take a look, shall we? Cultural Marxism supremacy to rule them all! So why is there an Rise in God? Tolkien is rolling in his grave. There is no black people in Middle Earth. Uh, black guy? Really, SJWs? 
You think you could blend this in seamlessly and we wouldn't notice? Uh, cultural appropriation. Why is there a black man in my European culture? Yeah, let's shoehorn black people in the Middle Earth. I didn't know Mordor wanted to invade Chicago. What's the Isengard doing in Middle Earth? That black guy was still a monkey that has yet to be a- Holy fucking shit, what is wrong with these people? Nope, it's literally all just a tidal wave of racism. But hey, that's no surprise. It turns out that fantasy settings loosely based on medieval Europe are really, really popular with the white nationalist crowd. Let's have a look. I went to that beacon of rationality known as Stormfront to see what those gallant white warriors thought of Tolkien's work. Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope you are having a white Christmas. I just finished viewing the Lord of the Rings movie. It was fantastic. The racial mythology of Tolkien's masterpiece came clear through. I especially liked Aragon and Barimar. I am butchering the spelling. Very strong, healthy, white male warriors. And Legolas, the elf archer, looks exactly like a cloaks movement warrior friend of mine from Portland R. The dark riders are very dark, and the orcs and racial bastardized mutations, no effort to learn their side. In the movie, one of the elves, Elrond, makes reference to the days of purity coming to an end, when the darkness will flood northwards from the south and cover the lands with darkness. In reality, a gold ring has been forged, counterfeited, for each of the white nations in the form of a central bank, using a deceitful gold standard which was later removed. The Jews now have almost all the gold in their private vault, gold ring, or monopoly, and all the central banks will be unified into one world bank, one ring, under which we will all be enslaved in darkness, ignorance, forever. Could Tolkien, the son of a banker and a master of linguistics, have been unaware of the double meanings in the choice of words and the implications they conveyed? Sorry, I didn't see this thread when I posted my review of the movie. I agree with all your observations. The racial themes are unmistakable, as is the idea that greed and gold rings, central banks, are enslaving all white nations. Remember that Tolkien didn't publish Lar until the 1950s and had to accept the British victory version that Hitler was all bad, etc. to get published, keep his university position, etc. But Tolkien's Lord of the Rings can be viewed as an English rival to Wagner's Ring Cycle, both very white racial and also anti-Semitic. There are about 20 different threads on this subject scattered around the board. I'm considering setting up a separate subforum under Cultura and Customs just for this, since, considering the times and the racial archetypes awakened by the story, I think this may become the most historically influential movie of all time. Now I know what you're thinking, silent rhetorical audience proxy. You're thinking, look, these guys are all saying that there can't be white people based on Tolkien's lore. Maybe the crazy people screaming racial slurs on the internet have a point. Well, let's see what Tolkien had to say about racism. Part 3. What did Tolkien think? I should regret giving any color to the notion that I subscribe to the wholly pernicious and unscientific race doctrine. Thank you for your letter. I regret that I am not clear as to what you intend by a rish. I am not of Orion extraction, that is, Indo-Iranian. As far as I am aware, no one of my ancestors spoke Hindustani, Persian, or any related dialects. But, if I am to understand that you are inquiring whether I am of Jewish origin, I can only reply that I regret that I appear to have no ancestors of that gifted people. Anyway, I have in this war a burning private grudge, which would probably make me a better soldier at 49 than I was at 22, against that ruddy little ignoramus Adolf Hitler. For the odd thing about demonic inspiration and impetus is that it in no way enhances the purely intellectual stature, it chiefly affects the mere will. Ruining, perverting, misapplying, and making forever accursed that noble northern spirit, a supreme contribution to Europe which I have ever loved and tried to present in its true light. I have the hatred of apartheid in my bones. And most of all, I detest the segregation or separation of language and literature. I do not care which of them you think white. Uh, okay. I agree, this seems to run contrary to what happens in The Lord of the Rings, where all the white people are good and all of the people of colour seem to be working for Sauron. 
And it's nobody's fault but Tolkien's that you have to dig waist deep into his notes and letters to find out that this isn't the case. But I'm a giant nerd, so I did that. When Tolkien first wrote about the Blue Wizards, Alatar and Palando, he said that they had arrived along with Radagast, Saruman and Gandalf, and their task was to go into the east and the south of Middle-earth and to help the race of men form a rebellion and resistance against Sauron, and that they must have failed and been seduced to evil, just as Saruman was. However, later Tolkien changed his mind, and he wrote that Alatar and Palando arrived long before the other three wizards, that they still went into the east and the south to help with the resistance against Sauron, and that they must have been successful, otherwise the men of the west would have been horribly outnumbered. So not only does that tell us that people of colour also fought against Sauron in different parts of Middle-earth, it also implies the existence of two wizards of colour. It's also important not to overlook the fact that the city of Umbar, which is closely allied with Mordor, is ruled over by men of the same race that established Gondor, the Numenorians. Meaning that there were white people and people of colour fighting on both sides. Oh, and remember that bit earlier about how Harfoots, the most common kind of hobbit, had brown skin? Well, Samwise Gamgee was a Harfoot. Not only that, but Tolkien referred to him in his letters as the chief hero of Lord of the Rings. So the hero of Lord of the Rings is a hobbit of colour. None of this is to say that Tolkien's work is free of racism, of course. There's many examples of actual racism in his work. The Urukai are very clearly black-coated. He describes the orcs as squat, broad, flat-nosed, sallow-skinned, with wide mouths and slant eyes. In fact, degraded and repulsive versions of the, to Europeans, least lovely Mongol types. And let me just comment here, I can see what he was trying to do. He was very clearly trying to display that he doesn't think that Mongol types are ugly. Or at least maybe they're only ugly to Europeans. Describing the orcs as a degraded and repulsive version of the least lovely. Because they're all lovely, really. I can see he was trying to get his point across without being derogatory, but look. Aside from the phrase Mongol types, which is just... No, you shouldn't be basing your evil monster species on a race of real people. Tolkien explicitly drew a connection between his dwarves and the Jewish peoples via language, but also gave them the traits anti-Semites most commonly associate with Hebrews, notably extreme greed and isolationist tendencies. However, as is pointed out in this excellent article by Rebecca Brackman, which I've linked in the description, J.R.R. Tolkien later came to regret his original anti-Semitism and tried hard to undo it, rewriting The Hobbit for later editions in such a way that Thorin's greed became a personal trait rather than a trait of all dwarves as it had previously been in earlier editions. He took this further in The Lord of the Rings when the dwarfish love for wealth is replaced with a deep appreciation for beauty and craftsmanship, and the idea of dwarves being selfish and cowardly is supplanted completely with the idea of them being courageous and unerringly loyal friends. And even as a 12 year old first reading the books, I could see that the resentment and distrust between dwarves and elves and the strong friendship that developed between Legolas and Gimli in spite of that was a clear message about the foolishness of racism. J.R.R. Tolkien's work was undeniably racially problematic, and even he realised this. One of his greatest regrets in later life was not making the orcs more sympathetic and layered rather than just simply biologically evil. But many of the apparent racist aspects of his work exist solely in the lens of fan interpretation, and often his work is appropriated by adherence to a school of thought that Tolkien himself despised, who insist on misappropriating his stories to further a viewpoint Tolkien entirely disagreed with. His works were undeniably racist. They just weren't as racist as the fandom that surrounds them makes them seem. 
So that's my opinion on racism in the Tolkien fandom. If you liked this video, please share it around. That's the main thing I'd actually like done with this one, because I think this is one of my more actually important videos. If you didn't like it, please feel free to call me a cultural Marxist's joie cook in the comments. And remember, your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies. I'm hoping to do a lot more videos like this, talking about social issues in regards to nerd culture. But they take a long time, uh, I have a lot of research to do for them, and I try to get them done to a slightly higher standard than my other videos. I'm also trying to raise my standard for videos in general, because it really needs it. But for this one in particular, I would like to thank Leanne Hamilton, Sam Poots, Connor Lennon, Sonia Faith Lund, and Chris Cullen for lending their voices for uh, various quotations. Thank you all, and thank everyone who's watching this. You're great.